Hello, I'm Mohamed Noor. I'm a professor of biology at Duke University, and I'm an occasional science consultant for the Star Trek universe. I'm very excited to talk with you today about the nature and definition of the word species. And I want to do it today in the context of humans, of course, and in the context of one of the species that gets mentioned the most frequently throughout the Star Trek universe, which is the Vulcans. So let's dive right in. I want to focus on some events and some script from the really cool Enterprise episode E Squared. To set the context for what's happening, the Enterprise, this is the NX-01 Enterprise, is approaching a nebula when all of a sudden out comes this alternate timeline Enterprise. And it's commanded by somebody who is half Vulcan and half human. No, not him. It's somebody named Lorian, who happens to be the son of Commander Trip Tucker from the original Enterprise, as well as T'Pol. This is a T'Pol cosplayer in this case. This opens the question, if Trip Tucker and T'Pol could interbreed, why are they different species? What the heck? Well, let's take a step back and think about the question of what is a species? Now, despite Darwin's book having the title On the Origin of Species in it, he actually only addressed this point very indirectly. Darwin actually viewed species as points along a continuum. Now, I want to use an analogy to try to explain this. Let's think about this in the context of color. So colors also fall along a continuum. How different do two colors have to be to be called a different color? So as you can see here, and I apologize for those of you who may be colorblind, you see here both panels are blue. Now we see that one panel is blue and one panel is green. And now, hmm, what do we say about this? Well, they're both blue, but one is a kind of different blue. So in this case, they both have the same name. We still call them blue, but they're somewhat different. So it shows you how there's a continuum there where some things can be quite different but still have the same name and sometimes not. Now, the same kind of thing can happen when you look at evolutionary divergence. So I want to use here the canine family tree. This is just a partial canine family tree. So looking at the first guys here, there's a German Shepherd and a Collie. Everybody would agree those are two of the same species. Those are both dogs. As we go a little bit further out in evolutionary divergence, so they have a further back common ancestor, we have a wolf and we have the two dogs. Eh, it's a little bit more equivocal. They can make hybrids and stuff like that, but a lot of people consider a wolf to be a separate species. We go further out, still in evolutionary divergence, we have this Arctic fox. That is solidly a different species. That is clearly not a dog or a wolf. So as you can see, species represent stages in this continuum of evolutionary divergence. And the gradations seem to range from solidly the same, like the first two I talked about, to solidly different, such as the Arctic fox to the dogs. Now, on a practical level, how do you decide if things are different species? Well, you go outside and usually you just kind of look. But how different do you have to be to be called separate species? Well, here we have two ducks. Are they the same species? Are they different species? They both look pretty similar on one hand, but you can see some differences between them. Now, in fact, biologists, instead of relying on appearance, use a very popular definition of species called the biological species concept. This was popularized starting almost 100 years ago by Theodosius Dobzhansky and Ernst Meyer. And the idea here is to think about gene pools. That's really where it comes down to. So the definition is basically that species are groups of interbreeding natural populations that don't exchange genes with other such groups. So I have here sort of a fictional example. We have a group that's red and a group that's blue. And again, I apologize to any of you who might be colorblind. Now imagine the red ones can exchange genes with each other and produce offspring. The blue ones can exchange genes with each other and produce offspring, but maybe the red and blue cannot exchange genes. Like you don't have any genes moving from the red group to the blue group. So in this sense, individuals might have traits that prevent this exchange of genes. And those traits are what are indicative of being separate species. So I want to explore this both in real life, which is super cool, and in Star Trek, which is also super cool. One category of trait that might make it so interbreeding doesn't happen is when breeding is separated between the groups by either space or time. So I have a really cool example here in the context of the Himalayan ginger. These are two different species of plants, as you can see them both here. Now, what happens in the context of these two plants is their flowers open at different times, and then they're pollinated by either bees or flies when, when they open. The one on the left actually flowers in mid-August primarily, and the one on the right flowers mostly in early to mid-June. There's almost no time almost no time at all when both of them are flowering at the same time. So it's not possible for pollen to move from one of these plants to the other plants very easily. This actually makes it so they are separate gene pools. That's pretty cool. And it has to do with this sort of timing of when breeding happens. Now in Star Trek, of course, one of the most popular examples of some sort of cyclical timing of breeding is the pun far. 
used by Vulcans. Now, with them, every seven years, they go into this rage and they have to, and they have to mate. But that's not really a good example because Vulcans can and do mate often outside of Ponfar, as we've seen in the various Star Trek series. Also, humans mate all the time. So it doesn't really stop the exchange of genes between Vulcans and humans, but it still shows this sort of cyclical breeding aspect. That's probably not something that, that causes them to be distinct species. A second category, which is really ubiquitous and people don't think about, is preference differences. Now, this is something, again, you see it all the time. When you go outside and you see dogs or you see cows or you see grass, you're not inclined to interbreed with them, nor are they inclined to interbreed with you, though sometimes with the pollen might seem like it. <laughs> Even with closely related species like a chimp, you might see one at the zoo, you're not inclined to breed with it, it's not inclined to breed with you. So why is that? Well, the cues that are necessary to elicit this sort of desire to interbreed are not present. Now, I actually studied this myself in some North American fruit fly species. They're named Drosophila pseudo-obscura and Drosophila persimilis, but don't worry about that. But these flies co-occur and they basically look identical. But interestingly, they sing different songs. When a male fly wants to mate, he comes up to the side of the female, extends his wing, and he vibrates it. And the females will reject males that sing the wrong song. I'm going to, to show you a little clip for each one. This is the first species, Drosophila pseudo-obscura. <laughs> And this is the second species, Drosophila persimilis. You can hear the difference between those two flies pretty clearly. And that is an auditory preference, which is what they're showing in the context of picking who it is they want to breed with. And that's just one example. For many other fruit fly species, smell is more important, but basically the same thing applies. Now, this is one that potentially does apply in the context of Vulcans. We've heard T'Pol many times through the series Star Trek Enterprise complain about, oh man, the humans really stink. <laughs> so probably that's something that somewhat, but not so much, produces interbreeding between Vulcans and humans, and that might be contributing to what makes them be called distinct species. Now, sometimes the issue isn't actually mating, but it might have to do more with fertilization. Now, fertilization is interesting. This is when the sperm comes together with the egg to combine the genetic material and make a new offspring. We tend to think in the context of internal fertilization, but there's lots of species out there that just spew their gametes out in the oceans. So looking at red and pink abalone, these are really cool mollusks. They spawn at very similar times, but the sperm will only fertilize eggs that came from females of the same species. Well, how does that work? Now you can see this happening in this one figure. Now, this is not six different sperm. This is a time course from left being early to right being late of one sperm as it's actually fertilizing an egg. What happens in this case is there's proteins on the surface of the sperm that interact with the fibers surrounding the egg. And that interaction has to be successful and it has to happen so the sperm can access the egg cell membrane and insert itself for fertilization. What some geneticists have done is they've identified the actual proteins on the sperm and egg that are involved in this interaction and differences between the two species in those proteins that make it so sperm from one species cannot fertilize the eggs from the other species. That is so cool. This may be what's happening in the context of Vulcans and humans to make them be considered distinct species. There's some text from the episode. I'm going to just read a little bit of the script. T'Pol says, that's impossible. Vulcans and humans have never been able to reproduce. And Dr. Flock says, according to Lorian, I discovered, or rather I will discover, a method of successfully combining human and Vulcan genomes. It's not exactly clear what he means here, but it seems to imply that maybe human sperm doesn't fertilize Vulcan eggs very easily. And Phlox had to come up with some technique to do that, perhaps manipulating some of these proteins, just like what I was talking about in the abalone. That's really cool. And the last thing I'm going to mention briefly is that sometimes species do make hybrids, but those hybrids are sickly or sterile. Probably one of the most commonly discussed examples of this is the mule, which is the sterile hybrid of a horse and donkey. I like this one better. This is a zonkey. This is the hybrid of a zebra father and a donkey mother. And they're actually real. They're found in South Africa. And look at their legs. It looks like they have socks on. But just like mules, zonkeys are typically sterile, especially the males. So is it possible there's some Vulcan human fertility barrier? Well, we don't actually know, because as far as we know, Lorian didn't have any kids. We don't know if he just if he couldn't or he just decided not to. Same thing for Spock. So we don't really know. However, we do know that Romulan human hybrids are fertile. And we know this based on the Next Generation episode, The Drumhead, where we learn of someone who's a grandkid of a Romulan and a human. That was crewman Simon Tarsis. So given that Romulans and Vulcans are so similar, we guess maybe there's not so much of a Vulcan human fertility barrier, but hard to tell for sure. But even looking at all this, 
we have to remember that species formation is a process. It's not a point. It's a process along this continuum of evolutionary divergence over time. It's not something that just happens and bam, they're new species, but it's over time, they get a little bit more different, a little bit more different. They're more and more solidly species, kind of like what we saw with the dog to wolf to Arctic fox. And it's important to remember that none of these traits have to be 100% effective for you to label them as separate species. In fact, most of you watching this video right now are actually hybrids. <gasps> no, I'm serious. Well, you may or may not know is that there was a lot of human Neanderthal interbreeding in the last 100,000 years. And just about all humans, except those from straight African ancestry, have some Neanderthal ancestry. So you are a hybrid too. Whoa! But humans and Neanderthals, still separate species. Now, lest you think it's just humans and humanoid aliens in Star Trek, there was a recent review that estimated that at least 10% of animal species on Earth and 25% of plant species on Earth sometimes hybridize with another species. So really, Star Trek wasn't so far out with so much alien interbreeding. What are your thoughts in the context of species in Star Trek and the amount of interbreeding that seems to happen between them? Let us know in the comments, and thank you again for tuning in to Biotrekkie Explains. See you next time.